Welcome, everyone. My name is Dana Schultz. I'm the program associate at the Greenwich Village Society for Historic Preservation. Before we get started, please silence or turn off your cell phones. I would very much like to thank the New School for Public Engagement for co-sponsoring this program with us and for hosting us this evening in their lovely space. As many of you know, GVSHP is a nonprofit organization that works to preserve and educate about the architectural and cultural history of Greenwich Village, the East Village, and, and NoHo. Besides hosting educational lectures and tours such as these, we offer an in-class education program to elementary and middle school students and work to maintain and extend the historic district protections and appropriate zoning designations for our neighborhoods. Our work is largely supported and made possible by our members. If you'd like more information about what we do, there are newsletters, program flyers, and membership brochures on the back table where you signed in. I encourage you to find out more, join our email list, and if you like what we do, join or otherwise help support and make possible our work. It is now my pleasure to introduce tonight's lecturer, Larissa Bailiff. Ms. Bailiff has been lecturing at MoMA since 2003, where she gives public gallery talks and private tours, and teaches both in-person and online courses. She also teaches survey art history courses at FIT and has taught, and has taught courses at Pratt. She has worked with other museums, including the Morgan Library, the Art Institute of Chicago, and the Brooklyn Museum. Ms. Bailiff loves thinking about modern art and drawing audiences into its history in different ways. Please join me in welcoming Larissa Bailiff. So, uh, hello everybody, and, um, okay, sorry, what up? How's that? Better? No, yes. Okay, hello everybody. Thank you for coming out in the rain. And I wanna thank um, GVHSP and the New School for having me here to talk about this wonderful topic of Jackson Pollock and the village. Um, I was very excited when they proposed this idea um, because it allowed me to really focus on, um, well, an aspect of Pollock. Um, certainly if you picked up um, biographies or um, seen Ed Harris's movie, um, you know, I don't have as much time um, to uh, spend with you tonight um, talking about Jackson Pollock, and I really do want to focus on um, both his early years, but also um, ways in which he interacted with the village throughout his career, and that's my intention. So um, I will break this down into sections. Um, they will not be clean and even, but they will hopefully allow for us to understand um, Pollock's time in the village and what he gave to it and um, you know, what he got from it. So um, I'm just starting with a photo here from about 1944. So that puts him um, firmly in, uh, in the village at that time. Um, although I have to admit, this was actually taken in Massachusetts, so I cheated, but the time is right. Um, my, and I'm always honest and very subjective, I have to admit. So, and by the way, I just also wanted to say it's nice to see some familiar faces in the audience as well as many, many new ones. But as I look out there, I see some people that I've met before. So, um, I came up with this title, uh, I in the Village, Jackson Pollock's Downtown Years, um, you know, given the premise that I would be talking about Jackson Pollock and his experience in the village. Um, and I pulled the title actually from the work of Mark Chagall. Some of you might be familiar with this work or the title. Um, and so my caveat, of course, is that I'm not going to talk about Chagall and Pollock together at all. Um, <laughs> But I, I wanted a snappy title, and I really liked some of the sense of this. And of course, we can enjoy Marc Chagall's picture. You can go to the Museum of Modern Art. It's on display right now. Um, but again, I can't make any links between Marc Chagall and Jackson Pollock. In fact, I don't think Pollock likes Chagall's art at all. Um, he had much to say about European art, although a very ambivalent and interesting relationship with European artists we'll discuss. But for a long time, he said he was you know, anti the European trends. Please. Oh, you guys wanted to hear me tonight. <laughs> so um, just to give us a little background on this particular work, Marc Chagall, in his Eye in the Village, um, 
with the emphasis on the personal pronoun there, is thinking about um, his life in Paris around 1911, um, where he is ensconced in the new art trends, but very much, um, as he will continue to throughout his life, thinking about his past in Vitbesk. So incorporating the idea of coming from a place a bit more rural than Paris at that time, although Vitbesk had quite a population, but this idea of coming to the big city. And in some ways that does foreground what we're going to be talking about here, because Jackson Pollock um, you know, came to New York City, um, obviously very different from the way it is today, although um, you know, we'll talk about some of the continuities. Um, but he was um, you know, coming in some ways from a smaller place to a different kind of village. And we're going to sort of explore and interrogate what that village was that he um, entered into. Um, I do want to put an emphasis on the I as well, because for Pollock, um, in many ways, it was about the id. And it was about the personality. And I'm telling you nothing new there, although I will elaborate, right? And this idea of once he came to the, you know, the village, Greenwich Village, um, the idea that he was very much a part of it and needed it, as we'll discuss, but also sort of kept himself apart in some ways. The eye was very important to him. And in fact, why a lot of people came to the village and what they found there was communal support to be an individual. And I think that was incredibly important for Pollock. Um, just to um, read a little bit of a quote, and this is Jed Pearl sort of um, summing up some George Simmel. Um, he said, Jed Pearl says, for only when we have a sense of setting in place can we begin to see how the city became a center for the, quote, elaboration of the individual? This idea that the village provided that, it provided camaraderie and bravery and inspiration on all levels. And Pollock needed that and, again, gave to it. But he kept that eye sometimes very separate. It was a tricky eye and a difficult eye, Pollock was, and a very talented eye. He became the hero and leader of the village. But enough Chagall and um, enough of Europe for now. Um, we move ahead a bit in time and locate Jackson Pollock, <clears throat> um, you know, where he essentially came from, uh, Los Angeles. Um, his parents, you may or may not know, sort of uh, floated around with different jobs. His parents sort of separated um, for work um, reasons. He grew up on, you know, different farms and, um, you know, engaging in, in labor and surveying with his father. Um, so, you know, he was from the outdoors, but he also um, grew up in many places around Los Angeles. So he did know a sense of city. Um, but here we have a photograph of him um, in the outdoors, um, perhaps in Los Angeles, but possibly in Arizona, actually, um, from around 1927, 28. And he's all dressed up like a Westerner. And of course, this is going to be one of the tropes that he will play up throughout his life, this idea of the outsider, the Westerner, understanding the great expanse of land, um, et cetera, right? And he did. Um, he was born in Cody, Wyoming. And that's something that he sort of plays up a bit more than his Los Angeles roots. But he was 10 months old when his parents moved away from Cody, Wyoming. So, um, but this sense of, um, you know, someone who hadn't grown up in New York, um, immersing himself in the village, um, you know, both exciting and expansive for him. Um, and this is a picture, he's all dressed up in 1930 when he makes his way to New York. Um, he's been kicked out of um, the Manual Arts High School for producing subversive literature um, against the sports team and then fighting with the PE coach, yes. Um, he was actually led in this endeavor by a really great art teacher, um, a sort of um, almost an early beat um, figure um, who wore a little goatee and encouraged his students to you know, make radical art and also to, to partake in subversive politics. Philip Guston, by the way, you may know, went to the same high school and he was kicked out and he left. He said, fine. But Jackson Pollock and his mother tried to get him back in. He did, and then he got kicked out again. So um, this wasn't going to go very well. And, um, you know, he had some friends, but he realized that um, he wanted to, again, expand upon this. And he makes his way to New York and um, takes up with his brother Charles, who was already beginning to be an established artist. So again, this photo is, um, there he is, perhaps trying to pose a bit older than his years. His hair is um, cleanly cropped, and I say that because before this time, he, he wore his hair rather in a sort of bohemian long style. 
Um, so he was, you know, trying to create a sense of self, certainly. By the way, um, was he a fantastic artist at this point? No. <clears throat> In fact, he talks about needing to find rhythm. He finds that his drawing is very stuck. Um, and, you know, he needs to build his skills. He's not adept like Charles. Um, but he does decide, um, eventually, that that's what he wants to pursue, to follow Charles and go to New York. Um, by the way, you know, an early portrait, we're not quite sure when it was um, completed, but done after he moves to New York um, in 1930 there. And um, I always think it's so interesting to look at self-portraits and to think about what they convey. And if I were to ask, you know, any one of you in the audience here, I think you would comment upon the sort of dark tone of this, right? Um, you know, it's, it's romanticized, it's brooding, um, and probably pretty appropriate for an artist just starting out, trying to find himself. Um, and what did his art look like during this period in the early 30s? And again, we'll locate him more geographically in just a minute, but, um, you know, he's looking to the likes of um, Albert Pinkham Ryder, and um, so we have here um, a work by Pollock here, perhaps even looking more uh, modern, I don't know, um, but an earlier work by Ryder. So this is, you know, Pollock sort of trying to establish a sense of self. Um, Charles is studying at the, um, that is Charles Pollock, um, one of um, Jackson's older brothers, is studying at um, the Art Students League in the 1930s under Thomas Hart Benton, um, with whom I'm sure many of you are very familiar. Um, a charismatic figure, um, here he is with some of his painting behind him. And um, Pollock was very, very attracted to him as a type of father figure, as a mentor, and their relationship um, was incredibly important. And this is where we sort of put our first section of um, village life. Um, Thomas Hart Benton lived on East 8th Street, and very soon um, Charles and Jackson will be living almost across the street at 46 East. Street. So this notion of proximity, which allows for um, these friendships, this mentorship, et cetera, um, to develop is, is critical. Um, here, just images of the Art Students League, right? Um, and a photo of a particular class around 1932. And um, Pollock attends for a couple of years, um, sort of on and off. Um, he works with Benton. When Benton takes off in 1933 um, to fulfill a commission in Chicago and just basically leaves his students hanging, um, for a little while, Pollock works with John Sloan. Um, but he's not so interested in that. And by the way, some of you may or may not know this, but Pollock wanted to be a sculptor first. He said, I want to be like Michelangelo. So keep that in mind, because that's not where he, I think, found his talents lay. Um, but this just gives us a sense of, um, of artists there circling around a, a teacher and mentor figure. Sloan was very important there. Benton was very important there. Um, Gorky didn't teach there, but he would sort of storm around and hang out with Stuart Davis. I mean, it, it sounds like it was a pretty amazing um, you know, uh, time at the Art Students League. And of course, I've put the address on here. It doesn't fit into my village, does it? Um, at West 57th Street. This is no located near where the galleries were, the few galleries that there were in the 30s and then expanding in the 40s. Um, but of course, this was a sort of subversive outpost of teachers and students, who most of which lived in the village, right? Um, so it was sort of, you know, an uptown um, village group, if you will with lots of discussion and, and interesting teaching. Um, so Benton um, was working on a mural when Pollock came to study under him. And Benton, uh, despite the fact that um, Pollock wasn't necessarily extremely talented, um, took a liking to him, fostered their relationship, got him little jobs. Um, and for the first three months that Pollock um, was experiencing Benton, Benton was working on um, this mural for the new school, in fact, although it was later transferred. Um, so this is a section of the, the great mural America today. Although this was painted in Benton's studio. He didn't want to paint just on the wall, so he actually painted at the studio and then had it put onto the wall, which I think is very interesting. And so Pollock would have been at his house all the time, checking this out, seeing this um, sense of regionalism, right? This idea of um, American artists painting American subjects of the city, but more often rural subjects. And we might think of, um, of course, Thomas Hart Benton, um, Grant Wood, um, 
and uh, John Stuart Curry um, and others, but um, you know, pretty much uh, a very accepted um, style of painting, and of course, very different than what um, Pollock is going to do. Um, this itself is a city scene, um, jazz dancers, um, you know, multiple views, uh, lovers kissing, um, you know, boxing um, activity, and so on and so forth. Um, but of course, uh, Pollock also would have been exposed to what um, Thomas Hart Benton was more known for, his um, subjects of cowboys and rural scenes. Something like this, for instance, The Ballad of the Jealous Lover of Lone Green Valley of 1934. Um, and I won't talk too much about it, but again, sort of a Western scene, um, very sort of narrative bits, and the sort of um, what has been described as a very almost mannerist style, right? Um, almost El Greco dressed up as cowboys, um, as some people have put it. And it's, you know, um, not my observation, but I think it's a very good one, so I'm going to steal it. Um, and, you know, just to put it up against what Jackson Pollock is creating here, this is a famous early work of his, Going West. Um, and I think, you know, uh, I needn't spend too long um, laboring the points of comparison, what he's getting from Benton in terms of that swirling sort of um, atmosphere, the stylized forms, um, the Western regionalist um, subject matter, et cetera, with a touch of Ryder or maybe Blakelock and a, a bit of darkness there. But also, this allows us to set the stage to see how far Pollock comes, even if you have an idea in his mind of Oliver Drip um, to, to start here. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so I just throw in two portraits, um, a self-portrait with Rita and a portrait of Rita with TP, their son. Um, this one is on display at the Brooklyn Museum right now. So if you have a chance to see it before their 1920s Youth and Beauty show closes on the 29th, not much time, but um, a wonderful, fascinating work. Um, and one thing I want to point out about Benton, although it doesn't relate to our topic, he was five feet tall. So I think he's taken some idealized... <laughs> <clears throat> notions about this. Maybe it's the El Greco in him. But anyway, um, very much in love with Rita, um, and one thing leads to another, and they have this, this child TP. Um, I just point this out, or, or put this up there to, to give us more exposure to Benton's work, the kinds of things Pollock would have seen, and also to give us a sense, um, in regionalist style, if you will, um, the happy family life that Pollock found himself involved with. Um, he babysat TP, during the day when Rita and um, Thomas Hart Benton would go to the Art Students League and when he wasn't going there. Um, he started coming to their house, again, basically across the street on East 8th, um, for dinner, two, three, four times a night, I'm uh, sorry, a week. Um, and uh, might have seemed like that. Um, he, you know, Rita introduced him to spaghetti, one of the, the famous um, evenings, the dinner. He said, ma'am, what is this? I'm used to ham and roast beef, and I don't know what this is. And, and Rita had made him wonderful spaghetti with, um, you know, spaghetti and meat sauce. And um, I think it's very interesting because later on, when Pollock moves out to the springs, apparently one of the things that he liked to cook for guests was spaghetti. So he got that from Rita. Um, and, you know, he may have been in love with her, it's hard to say, in a sort of, you know... Um, People have conjectured that, but she did provide a very sort of stable existence for him at this point, as did Thomas Hart Benton. Um, pictures of um, Thomas Hart Benton and his family um, jamming, literally, um, with uh, you know different instruments, and um, TP is playing there um, in both images. Um, apparently, they had Monday harmonica nights. Um, you know, the, they were called the Harmonica Rascals, and Benton invited Pollock to um, join in and to play with them. Now, his drawing wasn't really rhythmic or very good, and he wasn't a musician at all. So they finally settled on the Jewish harp and sort of sat him in a corner. There's a wonderfully endearing um, portrait that Benton uh, makes of Pollock you know, playing the Jewish harp, trying, trying, right? But they let him, and again, that was part of sort of um, fostering his spirit. Um, and here, just a picture of, um, that's Jackson Pollock there, shirt off, um, hanging out with Rita and some of the kids and um, other people at um, the Benton's home in Martha's Vineyards, where he would go every summer. So again, very much a part of his experience. Now, um, you know, not only does his work not look like Benton's for much longer than this, he will start to look for other mentors and um, 
perhaps father figures, but certainly artistically. Um, but uh, you know, again, it provides, I think, this sort of starting place. As Pollock said um, about Benton, he taught realism so hard um, that it gave me something to bounce against and become completely non-objective, which Benton didn't like in the end. But, um, but again, he sort of you know, allowed Pollock to do what he needed to do later on. Um, in 1935, uh, Benton moves away permanently, so um, moves to Kansas City, Missouri, where he's teaching. But just to um, talk about Pollock's experience during this time, um, you know, he's one of those artists that we describe living hand to mouth, right? Um, he is showing at the Washington Square Art Show, right? Um, so outdoor shows, trying to sell works for five to ten dollars, not selling anything. Rita's trying to get him shows of like ceramic shows um, where she's showing some work. Um, it's these people really looking out for him and trying to help him. Um, he'll show his first work actually at the Brooklyn Museum in 1935 in a show of watercolors of different artists. And again, just to sort of give us a sense of place, um, Pollock's apartment uh, at 46 East 8th doesn't exist anymore. I wanted to go take pictures, and, but it was, it was torn down five years after he moved out. But he lived there until the mid-1940s. And so this just gives us a sense of, um, of place and spaces where he would have walked. Um, again, I'm cheating here. This is, and if any of you have read the recent biography of de Kooning or Irving Sandler's Sweeper of Artists, you might recognize this is actually de Kooning's window looking onto Fourth Avenue. But I think it gives us a sense of, um, you know, the, the intersection between the village or the street and, um, and the studio. And in fact, um, when Jackson Pollock, um, he not only lived with Charles, but when Charles moved out, Sandy um, Sanford, one of the other brothers, um, moved in with uh, Jackson. And they had a wonderfully spacious apartment, right? So we're talking 1936. They had several rooms. And of course, Jackson claimed for his studio the one with the more space and the light and the window that did look on the street, right? And he let um, Sandy take the adjacent you know, studio room, which was really, really small. But they, they looked out. They had running water. They had a bathroom. Um, and you know, it would have looked something like this. And by the way, they were paying, no jealousy here, $35 a month. But it went up. So by 1940, it was $50 a month. Um, some of the places that Pollock would have frequented during this period, on a fancy night, San Remo's, or um, you know, maybe for lunch, Romany Marie's. Um, here, and it's just a small picture, and I don't have an interior scene, we have um, the Waldorf Cafeteria. Some of you may have eaten there. Um, it's now a Staples. Um, you wouldn't have eaten there. But um, <clears throat> apparently the food, and sorry, I don't want to offend anybody, not so great, um, but it was a good hangout place because you could just you know, sit at a table and drink coffee, exactly, right? Um, but, you know, at, after a while, the, the Waldorf cafeteria people got wind of the idea of these poor, you know, starving artists all living in cold water lofts or, you know, um, again, living hand to, to mouth and didn't want them just to linger with a cup of coffee. So they, they made rules like only four of you can sit at a table at a time and no more free water because you're bringing ketchup and making tomato soup out of it. <laughs> I mean, that's what they had to do, right? There wasn't much choice. So um, when they could, you know, these artists, and I'm saying these artists, it would be Jackson Pollock and a number of the New York School artists, the ones who lived around him, friends of his, people you would run into, um, would be eating in Washington Square Park. Um, and of course, the Cedar Tavern. And I think throughout my talk, I have put this picture at least three times, um, because I can't stress enough the importance of the Cedar Tavern, or the Cedars, as the artists called it. And Pollock had been going there since the mid-30s. Um, it was actually on 8th Street, then it was moved to University Place, and then eventually, at the end of its life, um, moved again and turned into a sort of um, upscale pub no longer exists, um, but, uh, and this is the university place um, address. But even in the 30s, he, you know, I mean, it was like a block from his house. And even when they moved it, it was a couple blocks away. And that proximity, well, especially if you wanted to drink a lot, um, was useful. Um, although you could also go and nurse a beer or a whiskey. And this is where the great discussions were held. Um, you know, people talk about, Lionel Abel talks about visiting the Cedar Tavern and saying there was a sense of ideas in the air and that you really couldn't understand what was happening in New York unless you let yourself feel 
the pull of those ideas. So, um, you know, as we look at these figures standing outside, gathered, you know, maybe smoking their cigarettes, um, you know, uh, talking, discussing, I have no idea what time of night this is. Um, this was the hangout where everybody went almost every night and you could find people to talk with and it was important um, to share those ideas and shape those ideas. Um, not the best photograph, but to go on um, a little bit more to um, some of the things that are impacting Pollock during this time, and you might be aware of um, you know, how important the Mexican muralists were at that time. Um, Diego Rivera had just had a show at MoMA in 1931 and a show before that at the Metropolitan as part of uh, a group of Mexican artists. Um, Siqueiros was here in New York teaching. Orozco would come in 1940 to do another um, fresco at MoMA. And people were very aware of this. Um, there were, again, being shown at the Met, Jacob Lawrence talks about the impact of um, the Mexican muralist on him in early 1940s. But even before that, Siqueiros had run his laboratory, um, his experimental laboratory, where you know he torched works and used spray paint and flung paint and dripped paint. Sounding familiar? Right? Um, so I'm not going to say that Pollock isn't, you know, original or that he wasn't very talented with what he did. Um, but there are others who were dripping and flinging and doing things, and I think it's important to acknowledge them. Um, so Siqueiros was one of that who, who said, you know, put your money where your mouth is. If you want to be radical politically, um, you know, and Pollock maybe didn't want to be radical politically, but you have to paint radically. You can't paint like Diego Rivera. Siqueiros would say, you have to be radical in your experimentation and try new things. And so here we see him discussing um, you know, the kinds of things and the ways one could paint. And, and we know that Pollock was very immersed in that. And um, this is happening near Union Square. Um, in fact, Jackson Pollock had met Siqueiros. And so here we see them um, even earlier on, um, you know, arm in arm there. Um, so an important influence on him. And this is a work by Siqueiros here, Collective Suicide, um, a quasi-historical work, but the sense of um, the conquistadors killing the indigenous people is sort of relegated to the very bottom there. But what is more interesting is this notion of the sort of abyss and the abstraction and the multiple layers. There are actually cutouts and wood projecting and um, you, know, you don't really know exactly how it was painted. Um, and... Uh, and actually, it was a psychologist who proposed this idea to Siqueiros, just a little tangent there. But this idea of um, this explosion of experimentation, which I think opens Pollock up. Um, here's a work that Pollock does around that time, The Flame, much smaller than a lot of the Mexican muralists. This is in MoMA's collection, not up right now. Um, and I'm comparing it now to the work of Orozco, um, and in fact, Pollock had actually seen Orozco's work at, um, at Pomona College in Claremont. He had gone with his brother, and they were fascinated by the strength, the aggressive, um, violent, um, figural uh, work. And so um, I'm just you know, comparing them here and allowing us to see some of that intensity, some of the peaks and forms, um, and you know, the boldness um, that he might have gotten from Orozco. Um, here's another work that Pollock does around this time, um, which must have um, been inspired by um, the work of Siqueiros and Orozco and others. Although we see the bodies becoming much more distorted, this naked man with knife. Um, but you were blind if you lived in New York and you were an artist and you weren't um, touched by um, Guernica, first shown in Kurt Valentine's gallery, and, um, and then at MoMA in 1940. Um, so many of the New York School artists say that this was pivotal for them. And I think it was pivotal for Pollock in the sense that he had, um, for a long time, said, we have to turn away from Europe. But he realized, what's the benefit of that as a statement, as a, as a you know, um, posturing, if you can learn from and then you know, supersede or take from um, what you need to and um, individualize your work. And so um, this is the installation of Guernica, as I said, at MoMA, although now you have to go to Spain to see it. But the distortion, the power, um, the black and white quality, of it, all of this gave him 
um, ideas and courage. And it was something to talk about, go back to the Cedar Tavern and talk about with people, to thrash out, you know, not to come up with a common understanding, but to say, how do you feel about this? No, I don't agree with that. Wait, but what about this? Well, have you seen how that translates into de Kooning's work? You know, Bill, do you, do you buy that? How do you feel about it? Those were the conversations that were shaping things. Right? Even more, right? Um, we have different artists who, um, I mean, literally working across the street um, from Jackson Pollock's studio. And everybody knew everybody. You know, later in 42, Lee Krasner says, I was so surprised that I didn't know Jackson. You know, we were in a show together, or we're going to be in a show together, and he's probably the only artist in this area that I didn't know. Everybody was on 9th Street or 10th Street or this street or that street. And she says, you just would go to their studios and you'd get to know them, you'd see their work. And that is how all these artists describe it. It was just sort of open studio. And it's, you know, not only would they be talking at the Cedar Tavern, but they would pick up from each other what they were doing. You know, oh, I like that use of yellow. Oh, there's a sale at Pearl Paints. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use that yellow. Um, and play off each other, right? Um, but again, they could learn, they could be mentored. And um, if you don't know Stanley William Hayter's work, um, and Atelier 17, um, or D. Set, was um, you know, set up in Paris first, but Hayter brings his print workshop to New York um, and teaches at the New School, in fact. But Pollock doesn't even want to walk that many blocks. He just wants to walk across the street and see what Hayter's doing. And he's fascinated, um, and this is one of Hayter's work there, and we can see the sort of intricate levels, the biomorphic shapes, the lyricism of the line, the difficulty. Now, Pollock wasn't very good at printing. Okay, I, I, he's gonna get good at something soon. But I, but I wanna suggest that he learns from all of these artists, even when he realizes his own limitations or what he doesn't have patience for. And he knows that he wants to to see what other people are doing and to drink that in. And he talks about this as being formative for him. And just, you know, to give us a little sense of place. I love um, Rudy Burkhart's photographs. Oops. Um, more Cedar Tavern. Like I said, I have to keep interjecting because, you know, every other night was there. And, um, you know, discussions, formulations. Um, Hayter had come from uh, England um, and then via France, bringing over his um, print workshop and teaching. And of course, um, I know you're fully aware of um, what turned out to be wonderful for New York and America as an infusion of um, intelligence, of ideas, of culture um, through the mass um, migrations of, well, scientists, thinkers, teachers, and certainly artists. And the Surrealists were among that um, during wartime. You know, tragic and terrible and difficult and very frightening for everyone. But again, for New York, um, it infused... Uh, you know, all of New York, but particularly the village, with this, this energy. Um, and so I didn't name all of the artists in this picture, but Max Dernst is in the center. And um, a number of these artists, Breton was living on 10th Street, Mata was living on 9th Street, and so Pollock began to know them. He already knew Leger, um, because Leger had been working during the, the WPA, and um, everybody was really fond of him and his um, abstract mode. Um, speaking of the WPA, I should just sort of float that out there and say, of course, so many artists were um, kept afloat by the WPA. We don't have most of the works that Pollock or his brother created during that time. Most of them were destroyed, um, whether they were good or not. Um, but, you know, it, it allowed them to thrive. Um, and so, um, you know, for several years of Pollock's life, he was uh, a part of the WPA, um, Burgoyne Diller was one of his supervisors. And thankfully, again, another figure, a mentor figure, who, you know, an abstractionist, um, who when Pollock wouldn't show up for work, he'd go to Pollock's house. You know, he wouldn't write him up. He'd say, what's up, Jackson? You know, are you coming back anytime soon? He had a lot of people covering for him. Um, another supervisor that he had later on was Lee Krasner. And people were jealous. They're like, why do you give him the easy assignments or don't give him assignments at all? But again, you know, he kind of lucked out. 
Um, but back to the Surrealists, um, and Miro had been showing already um, at um, Pierre Matisse's gallery, and I just put two wonderful works up. Um, some people say that a lot of the all-over sensibility of Pollock comes out of that. Um, and this is just one of my favorite Jackson Pollock works, so I stuck it in there. But, um, but also the notion of Moby Dick. I want to talk about um, both literature and titles, um, because in fact, um, Pollock didn't title most of his works. He did title this one, and many people were very interested in, um, in Moby Dick at this point. Um, another work that he creates, Pacify, um, was named Moby Dick. And somebody walked into the studio, I can't remember if it was Rosenberg or someone else, and said, no, that's Pacify. All right. You know, so, so titles were not that important to Pollock, and um, people often named things for him. He never titled his works beforehand, and I think that's interesting. Some artists do. They have a clear intention and start out with an idea in that way. Not Pollock. So, but you know, I want you to see this sort of wonderful scattering, the biomorphic forms, the blue field as relating to a number of um, artists who showed with the Surrealists or called themselves Surrealists, like Miro. Um, Pollock loved the work of Masson. And when we think about um, Pollock adding sand into a lot of his paintings, so does um, Masson, who was here. Um, and in fact, for a while, um, in 43, Krasner and Pollock start going to um, Mata's apartment, Roberto Mata, and um, are hanging out with a couple of the other um, wives, and um, David Hare is there. So this sort of mixture of American and Europeans, um, or um, Chileans, um, and uh, they start doing automatic drawing, and uh, poems, but mostly drawings. And um, so I throw this up as a sort of example of, um, you know, unconscious um, tracings, the pouring forth, and oftentimes a sort of more parlor game of passing it along. You start and close your eyes or add something to it, and then um, I'll add something to it, et cetera, um, but very involved in evoking the unconscious during the early to mid-1940s. And I just bring up this work not to talk too much about the iconography, but um, this is male and female a very large work that Pollock is doing. And again, there are many sources um, that he's drawing on at this point. Um, he is seeing a therapist. Um, many people discuss how uh, the Jungian therapist has him draw because he can't express himself. He can't talk about his feelings. So he's delving into his unconscious. He's thinking about Jung. Um, and we'll talk about other sources. But male and female may seem so archetypal and Jungian, but it's also a game that the surrealist used to play as part of their automatic drawing or their um, uh, corpse esquisse, right? The idea of, all right, I'll start and draw something and hand it to you and you'll start and draw something and they would often do men and women or male and female and come up with these sort of grotesque, monstrous, um, whimsical figures. And so underlying this as well, I think, are these relationships, this idea of um, sort of playfully putting on there um, signs and signage, and we notice the sort of numbers and you know the graphic marks and male and female, both archetypal and sexual, and um, you know coming out of games. Um, MoMA plays a big role, and of course it's not situated in the village. The um, the progenitor of the Whitney Museum. Um, is down here, and that's, that's an important source. But um, MoMA shows, um, and one of Pollock's good friends, a friend of many of these artists, is John Graham, who lives um, nearby to Pollock. And um, they go together to the Native American um, show, or the show of Indian art in America, I believe it's called. Um, and we see their sand painters, and of course that um, is something that Pollock claims is a source of his, and I think it is, from even his earliest days back in Arizona, um, where he sort of collected, not artifacts, but jewelry and design. Um, and, you know, I jump ahead with this work, but, you know, this idea of getting into the work that Pollock talks about, um, you know, as he moves past the mid-1940s, this idea that he will get to 
um, with his overall drip work, sort of stepping into the work, I think comes out of looking at, um, in some ways, other cultures and approaches to creating art. Um, but here, just a, a rare little glimpse um, at his apartment um, with one of his paintings, Guardians of the Secret, behind him. Um, here's stenographic figure. And um, at this point, we move into the realm of Peggy Guggenheim and how important she was as a patron and um, propagator of American art as well as European, having shows putting them side by side, um, you know, bringing some of the more radical painters, um, giving them a chance, if you will. Um, Jackson Pollock and Motherwell walk into her gallery and she says, um, I'm doing a show on collage. I need a collage, this is not a collage. I need a collage from you and from Motherwell. This is, you know, sort of first meeting. Well, neither Motherwell nor Pollock have ever done a collage. So they go back to Pollock's studio. And again, this camaraderie, and they figure out how to make some collages. Motherwell loves the process and will continue to add paper and different things at times um, into his works. Pollock hates the process, um, but they turn in their works, they show one each, and based on this, um, Peggy Guggenheim gives uh, Pollock the chance to show one more work in the Young Artist Spring Show. So each artist can bring one, um, and Pollock brings this stenographic figure in 42, and um, he leaves it there. Right? It's kind of like the old-fashioned jury system in Europe, right? And Peggy Guggenheim looks at it. Yeah, uh, I don't know. You know, and in fact, it's um, Mondrian, who's one of her advisors, as is Duchamp. And Mondrian says, after looking at it for quite a while, and Peggy notices that he's standing there, it's been 30 minutes, and he's still looking at it, he says, I think this work, stenographic figure, is the most interesting thing to come out of American art. So Peggy rethinks her position and decides that she's discovered Pollock. Thank you very much. And um, so, you know, and thankfully, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to be comic, but, um, but thankfully she has good advisors and she um, knows when to take their advice. And so um, this begins Pollock's journey with um, Peggy Guggenheim. He'd actually been working for um, her uncle's um, wife, Hilary Bay, at the, um, what becomes the Guggenheim Museum. He'd been an elevator operator and a janitor for a little while. And um, so he, he says goodbye. He and Lee Krasner write a little note um, to Hilary Bay and say, see you later, um, which was equally hard, or I should say more hard because um, Hilary Bay um, and her husband um, had a quite cantankerous relationship with their um, niece, Peggy. Um, here she is uh, standing in front of a, a later Pollock, but just to give her um, her due. And of course, a shot of her wonderful Art of the Century Gallery, which um, had a, a essentially a five-year run and um, was incredibly important to Pollock. Um, here's that pacify that I was talking about. And again, we can see him, um, or if you, you know, are familiar with his works from this time period, um, you know, really creating these dense surfaces, um, working on these sort of symbols, what look biomorphic and automatic, but um, worked and reworked and drawn over. And, um, you know, he's on to something. Um, this may seem like a very bleak uh, picture here, um, but it's, the, again, the, sort of the best I can do in terms of showing his apartment um, at this time and where he lives from the mid-1930s to um, the very end of 1945. And what it is showing us, as it says, is the blank canvas for mural. And some of you may know the story that Peggy Guggenheim commissioned him to create this enormous mural for her apartment. Um, really, really important. Um, and uh, he's struggling with it. He doesn't finish it by the time she gives him a show. And so he's continuing to work on it between 43 and 44. And he's got to get it done. And it's huge. And he's stuck. And he gets down to the very last, you know, 11th hour, if you will. And literally, over a 15-hour stint, is able to come up with this mural, um, which he calls mural. And so here is nothing, and here is something. Um, you know, and there's various theories. Um, some people say that he's painted his name into it, and, you know, but I think... Um, whatever's going on and, you know, due to our limited time, I just want us to experience this 
it is overall painting or all over painting, I should say. It is these interesting, almost figural, um, you know, lyrical forms there that touch almost from bottom to top, that he's covered the surface and found a way to paint big, if you will. Um, and again, that's gonna be a scale that, that interests him and preoccupies him. Um, it was very successful, she liked it, he felt very good about it, and he got it done. <laughs> so um, when he went to deliver it to her, oh, and I should say, by the way, um, you know, he had a very spacious apartment, but not that spacious. So he was living with Lee Krasner at this point, and um, Sandy had moved out. <coughs> and they actually had to break down the wall and cart out, you know, the wall in the middle of the night because they were renting it. And for 50 bucks, you don't get to knock down walls. But, um, and then they actually had to cut it into sections to remove it to get it um, to Peggy's apartment. And there's um, Peggy, happy in front of her mural. Um, she is, of course, the one who gets Pollock sold. And so this is the first work that the Museum of Modern Art purchases. They purchase it in 1944, and it's She-Wolf. And again, um, whether he named it or not, and you know, it is a She-Wolf and it isn't. It's a figure, it's many things, but it does nod to um, the mother of Romulus and Remus. It does seem, orig you know, originary in the sense of origins and, and myth, and yet linked to sand painting, linked to um, all kinds of different traditions. It was exciting, it was powerful. But MoMA wasn't sure, you know? I mean, they did it because Peggy suggested it. Um, but it, they, they didn't know that they had a sure bet here. Um, and they purchased a couple of other things as well, but Pollock was the only one that was being purchased. Um, there was no love affair with abstract expressionism or the New York School. Pollock would, it would not be rich by the end of his life. Um, and, you know, in early 1950, Rothko was sobbing you know, there's a description, I think it's Irving Sandler or someone else who says, you know, he was with, with Rothko at one point and Rothko said, what I would give to have a stipend, you know, of $500 a month for the rest of my life, I would give all of my paintings. And, um, you know, just to use Rothko as an example again, one of his wonderful color field works as, as he moves out of his sort of surrealist mode, um, yellow and blue, it's, I think it's on display at MoMA right now. One of our trustees at MoMA I hope you're not out there in the audience. Um, but uh, left the museum and said, get this crap out of here. This is not art. And left in the early 1950s because of a Rothko. So when I say there was no love affair, you know, de Kooning was absolutely broke showing at the um, Shawnigan Gallery, sorry, Charles Egan Gallery. Um, and, and Pollock was the only one who was, you know, doing anything um, financially. Um, of course, we're going to move him to the Springs. Um, and you know, here we see him um, with Lee Krasner uh, at the home that they purchased, um, oddly enough, sort of at the very end of the year. So they move in in November and it's absolutely freezing. Um, and at first Pollock has a studio upstairs, but he eventually in 47 or so moves out into the barn and clears everything out and um, is able to um, continue working. So there they are in the barn. And um, of course there's many photographs of him, but I wanna speed up here. So. Um, <coughs> Sorry. Um, one of the most exciting works, I think, from this time, um, I mean, the only way you can see it is to see it up close. He's nodding his head because um, it is not only thick and encrusted, um, but it has objects in it, coins, cigarettes, matches, um, the top of a paint tube, um, you know, a key in there, a skeleton key. Um, you know, as if he's just sort of let them drop. Now, Full Fathom Five, again, a title given by one of his neighbors in the spring, um, a reference to Shakespeare, but this idea of a shipwreck and the detritus sort of, you know, sinking to the bottom of the sea, perhaps. Um, but what we notice here is what is gone is um, what we saw in the stenographic figure or um, male and female. Um, the figure appears to be gone, although apparently there was a figure in there to begin with and he painted over it. Um, but we have this sort of overall sense of things and the skeins of paint. Now this is a transition work. So um, he starts on an easel and actually puts it down on the ground. So this is, you know, as we move into um, the technique which will really earn him his fame. And there's just some details. You can see a little bit of the stuff that's in there. Um, 
But again, it's, it's when he begins to hit upon the strategy, people call it sort of choreography, the performance, if you will, though he wouldn't have called it that. Harold Rosenberg called it the you know, sort of action, the arena. But um, Pollock losing himself in this painting, although as he said, no chaos, damn it. He knew what he was doing, but unstretched canvas, unprimed, um, working on them sometimes for days, sometimes even for months, um, stepping back, seeing what was there, calibrating um, you know, these skeins of paint, flinging turkey basters, um, unusual uh, use of brush, right? Not brush work, but brush. Um, Full Fathom 5 still has the paint brush, the gesture of that kind of marking, um, but we move to this much larger scale and a very different type of painting. Um, just stepping back, I mean, he begins this overall painting around 1948. And, um, of course, this is uh, the famous um, Life magazine spread um, that appears in 1949. And there he is um, standing in front of some of his works. And we see that, um, that sort of drama of, um, of, the, uh, of the paint schemes and the different colors, etc. And, you know, he's making it. Other people are not. Although he's not making much money. And he does feel uncomfortable about this. And, you know, um, that could be a talk in and of itself, but I just need to sort of throw that out there that, um, you know, he's still visiting um, his friends um, and he will continue to do so um, in the village throughout, you know, the end of his life. But this does separate him a little bit. He's the leader. He's shown that it is viable, that it can be viable, but he feels uncomfortable and that puts, you know, a lot of pressure on him. Some people say, oh, he's become uptown. I mean, he lived in the Springs, but, you know, he's showing in those galleries. Um, and just another example, though I don't think this picks up that well in um, slide, um, one of the very, you know, large overall works that he's known for. And while these hang in um, prime institutions, um, you know, they weren't purchased during this time. Um, and, uh, you know, like um, uh, Autumn Rhythm at the Metropolitan was only purchased after Pollock's death. So again, what we think of as Pollock succeeding and capturing everybody's attention and being financially successful, it wasn't happening. Um, this work was put on sale for $7,500 and it wasn't purchased. Um, you know, so he's, he's barely making it. Um, and there's just two details. Um, to mention a couple more events, um, and many of you may have seen this photograph before. Um, so some other people are getting a little bit of airplay, but there's Pollock right in the center there, right? Um, uh, it's Nina Lean's uh, photograph of the so-called irascibles. So in 51, um, you know, there's a show at the Metropolitan and a number of artists protest, um, the New York School. Um, they say, why aren't you showing any of us? If this is American art, where are we? You know, Stuart Davis is not the only American artist, or this person and that person. And so they write an open letter, it gets picked up by Life magazine, and the photograph is taken. So, you know, suddenly these artists who um, aren't making it financially um, are, you know, getting a chance to um, at least be seen, and um, popular culture is thinking about them. And I take us back to the Cedar Bar. Um, there's Franz Klein there. And again, and I'll be wrapping up soon, but I want us just to think about this period, um, you know, that Pollock is coming out on at least every Monday night um, during this period, um, the early to mid um, 50s. Um, he's visiting the jazz clubs, the five spot, Eddie Condon's, um, here he is with Clement Greenberg, his most ardent supporter, um, and, you know, still enjoying um, what the village has to offer. Um, and again, more pictures of him. Um, there is a very important development in 49, and that is a number of these artists who have been hanging out at each other's studios or trying to get together a sort of school, the 35 studio, et cetera, um, are you know, wanting to bring something more to the table. So they open the club, right, which is right near the Cedar Tavern. And um, this is not a picture of that, but this is something that comes out of that. And, and that's this notion that um, they're going to hold symposium. They're going to have invite other artists and musicians. And um, I'll show you a couple of their announcements. But um, one of the things that develops out of the development of the club in 49, um, you know, it's 
formal and informal, right? There's a certain membership. You're supposed to pay a little bit of dues. Um, it's not supposed to be about hard drinking. It's supposed to be maybe you nurse a beer, you eat some pretzels, um, you can invite a guest on a limited basis, but you're there to talk about the business of art. Not selling, but what does art mean? And they invite people to talk about medieval art and Asian art throughout the centuries and um, Kierkegaard, and sometimes they heckle these people, but it's intellectual and it's, it's full of spirit. And um, Leo Castelli actually brings a number of these artists together to hold a show. And so this is what we see, the artists bringing their work to the 10th Street. Um, gallery and, um, and holding um, works at the 9th Street show. Forgive me, that should say 9th Street. Um, and Pollock's name is, you know, it's alphabetical there, so you can see it, right, um, between Porter and, and um, Poussette Da. Um, but it, it's important for them to, um, you know, say that they have a place for themselves. It's not uptown. It's the only one that happens. It wouldn't have happened if Castelli hadn't made it happen. Um, but Pollock is there. He's amidst these people. He's not standing out and saying, I'm no longer a part of this group. And especially the sort of name recognition. When he goes to the Cedar Tavern after 1951, young artists apparently are coming up and sort of touching him and hanging out with him and want to sort of bask in his glory, even if he can still barely pay his bills. And just to mention, of course, that sense of the eye, um, you might be fully aware that, that Pollock's always running into trouble. I won't say he's violent. People said he wasn't violent. He was pugnacious. So, you know, on the way back from the bathroom, suddenly he'll shove you and you'll shove him and then all of a sudden, you know, a fight will ensue. But then in a few minutes, everything will calm down and you'll be showing him pictures of your kids. This is how it gets described, you know, or mostly he goes to the Cedar Tavern and he fights with Franz Klein, who everybody loved. And, you know, it's this sort of jocular, um, it was an outlet for Pollock. It's something that he needed. He needed that intellectual stimulation at the, at the club, and he needed to let loose. And of course, he'd gone back to drinking, and that's you know, unfortunate. Um, people say he, he couldn't drink much at all. You know, two drinks, and he was out anyway, but he didn't stop it, too. Um, there, by the way, is the Ninth Street show. Hans Namath's film. Here's some announcements, and you might see there, um, you know, Motherwell's talking, Max Ernst, they're having roundtables, discussions. It's, you know, um, for several years, this becomes the place to go. And the cool thing is, it's so close to the Cedar, the, the Cedars, as they call it, the Cedar Tavern, that once you were done, you might do some dancing. I mean, you know, it could lead to all kinds of things. Then you'd go to the Cedar Tavern, and you might finish the conversation more informally with drinking. Um, and I should say, Ironically, Pollock was coming every Monday night, and sometimes more, um, to meet with his therapist to deal with his drinking situation. But most of the time when he showed up at the club after therapy, he was already drunk. Um, there's just a poster um, to su you know, suggest the kind of things that were going on. But I wanna um, sort of bring us to, um, even in 1951, the fact that he didn't wanna be pigeonholed uh, with those overall works. Um, he felt uncomfortable with this mantle of the leader of the group, even whatever individuality that, that allowed him. Um, he begins implementing drawing more, and of course he'll, he'll do this in the next couple of years. The last year of his life, he doesn't do any work at all. But he's feeling pressure to live up to the critics, um, and he doesn't want to conform, and that's, that's an enormous struggle that he fought with, a demon. So um, this, I think, embodies a little bit of, of some of that change that's going on. And of course, um, he in some ways is, begins to bring back the figure in different ways, um, which was a no-no with the New York school at that point. Um, of course, I bring in this photograph of Pollock um, and his Model T, and you know, there is no happy ending for us. I can't, I can't change the story. I couldn't quite leave us in the village. But what I want to suggest, of course, is that Pollock never really left the village. He was visiting. Sometimes he would stay in a pied-à-terre of one of his patrons on McDougal. He felt at home as much as he did anywhere else. He needed that intensity, but also the memories, kind of like Marc Chagall, of the expanse of the West. And I think all of that comes into play in his art. He was troubled. There's no doubt about that. And, you know... His therapist could, could elaborate more, um, but uh, you know, it was difficult at the end, and, and um, you know, then he crashes his car. He's only 44 years old. Um, 
but he's respected among his peers, um, and some of them feel you know, that he's a rival, um, de Kooning in particular. Um, he dies in August, word gets out, people are either you know, summering nearby, um, they get on their telephones, you know, word is out, and it's a tragic event um, for many reasons. Um, but to come full circle, and Pollock is not in this picture, um, both of the Cedar Tavern, but also the club. Um, he dies in August. MoMA, who was actually offered a, you know, a mid-career retrospective, then it will turn in December into, a, unfortunately, a you know, posthumous retrospective. But I want to take us back to the village, not to MoMA, and to say um, one of the evenings at the club in November is dedicated specifically to Pollock for his friends, his rivals, um, you know, his admirers in the group, to come and discuss him and de Kooning's statement that Pollock broke the ice. Is that a compliment? Is that an insult? You know, what does this mean? What did Pollock mean to us? What does he continue to mean to us? And I think in a certain way, um, you know, what I've tried to express is that, that Pollock's um, formative life was based on all the experiences that he had in the village. This notion of um, what Rosenberg, Harold Rosenberg, called a geography of modernism, right? This space which allowed for Pollock to become the individual artist um, that he did, to challenge himself to um, create amazing abstraction and to inspire others to do so. Um, but in the end, I think it, it is a wonderful sort of celebration that the club and the artists that he knew for so long would get down to the nitty gritty and argue and discuss and create a dialectic about Pollock, right, in their own way, in a sort of village sensibility. And then everybody headed to the Cedar Tavern. So, thank you all. I, I love his work, yes. but I don't understand it. Uh -huh. I don't understand the art in its in its form. I guess on a technical basis. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So while I love the work, it's just hard for me to understand it. Yes. Maybe you can clarify that. Um, I I don't know if clarify is the verb I would use, but um, you know, and I just, that's um, my way of saying I too. Um, so the question was about the sort of difficult, the difficulty of understanding or entering into Pollock's works or, um, and I'm just gonna add a dash dash, other people, not you, but have said, you know, why is this art or, or it could be very childlike. And I think, again, um, even in this, this brief um, but whirlwind of, um, of a talk today, we've seen um, both development and some changes and, and differences in his art along the way. And I think there's different sort of meaning with different things. But when we talk about Pollock, we mostly mean, you know, when he, as de Kooning says, breaks the ice. Um, you know, works on mural scale and takes it on the floor and creates a new way of painting and, um, and creates an overall abstraction that has nothing to do with narrative or the figure or um, illusionism um, and is not completely tied to automatic drawing but is something other. And um, I think it is very challenging. And, you know, and I don't expect people necessarily to buy it, if you can afford to buy it. No, I mean buy it, you know, or like it. But... Um, but I think it is all about process. I think it is about um, enjoying may not be the word either, but, but becoming a part of the materials, utilizing them in, in such a completely new way that was important for him. Um, and again, allowing different qualities. I mean, whether, you know, putting Gre Clement Greenberg and other, other critics aside, what he's doing, but, but letting the materials um, sort of come forth in, in new ways. I think the layering of, again, skeins or flow or, you know, they're called drips, but I mean, they're not really drips, flingings, um, is really very, very interesting. You know, and, and we may not like each Pollock the same. And, um, you know, could a five-year-old do it? That's not your question, but um, I, I have an eight-year-old and a four-year-old, and when I go home tonight, I'm gonna make them do Pollocks. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, no, but it's hard to do a Pollock, right? But it doesn't, um, not everybody likes them, nor should you. Some of them are very dense, some of them are very lightened, some of them appeal to us for, 
for reasons of coloration, right? Um, but I think they do raise questions like, when was he done? Um, why? Why should we call this art and not something where, you know, somebody really um, does more drawing? You know, allows us to really see what they're doing. So. Um, it's a good question. And did he have any yeah. children who became artists? Did Jackson Pollock? Yeah. No, he didn't have any children. Um, so it was it was just him and. Um, we were talking about the movie, but um, that was made. But you know, in the movie, there's a very poignant scene where Lee Krasner says, "Jackson, I can barely take care of you." Um, <coughs> you know, but no, he didn't have any. Didn't have any children. Um, his uh, two brothers did have children, um, but they moved to Connecticut. Sandy moved to Connecticut, and um, Charles moved to I'm going to say Detroit. Um, but I could be wrong about it. I mean, it was somewhere um, near there. And, um, you know, Sandy wanted to make sure that Pollock, by the way, uh, would be taken care of. That's why he sort of stayed there until Lee could take over. Um, he talks, Sandy writes to the mom and says, I really can't leave Pollock, you know. Um, but neither one of them went on and did much with art. Um, again, Sandy had worked for the WPA, even changing his name, because you couldn't have two people with the same name in, this, in the building paid for by the WPA. But um, I think he realized that that wasn't going to be his professional career. And Charles went into, I believe, publishing, um, but didn't stick with it. And I think a lot of that was also financial. I mean, everyone had thought that Charles would, would be the artist of the family. Did he remain friends with Thomas Hart Benton till the end? It's a good question. You'll have to wait till I take a sip to find out. <laughs> um, and there's a great book called Tom and Jack um, that came out fairly recently. Um, they did remain friends, friendly. He stopped visiting them at Martha's Vineyard around 1937. Um, and, you know, they didn't see each other but maybe one or two more times. And um, Thomas Hart Benton came to Jackson's studio, um, I think it's in the mid 40s, and took a look at his work, but it was uncomfortable for both of them because they, it had been so intense and he had been such a father figure and yet it was so clear that um, everything that, that Thomas Hart Benton was against and aboard, you know, non-objective painting, European art and all of that, um, that Pollock couldn't be categorized as anything other than abstraction. And so there was not much he could do to sort of sugarcoat how he felt about it. I mean, he tried, um, but, but Jackson knew. And that was uncomfortable um, for both of them. Um, and the other thing that was problematic about that was that Thomas Hart Benton was a star in the 1930s. And though Jackson Pollock and the, the New York School and de Kooning and others weren't making a ton of money by the mid 40s or late 40s, everyone understood that progressive art was going to either be you know, surrealism or abstraction of some kind. So Thomas Hart Benton was passe. And, and that was an uncomfortable position to go from father figure to, you know, not really respecting what your, your protege does. And these are all great questions, by the way. How much art and what was his art like in the last five years of his life when he was in a downward spiral and mm -hmm. when he had switched therapies? And yeah. What was his art like during that time period? So, um, great question. What was his art like? And I, I sort of skimmed over that um, for, for several reasons. But, um, I mean, one of my favorite works is at MoMA, and it was done in 1953, and it's called um, Easter and the Totem. He was very inspired by Matisse near the end of his life. And so he picks up a number of bright colors. You see pinks and purples and greens. And you see, again, forms reappear. Maybe he's engaging with Motherwell and others. But certainly Matisse's retrospective, um, the year before his death, uh, that's Matisse's death, um, inspired Pollock to rethink some things. And um, a lot more emphasis on the vertical format than horizontal. Or if he's doing horizontal, they're more like friezes as opposed to big murals. Um, but he's struggling. Um, the works that he's showing at the biennial um, and different shows, um, people are asking him to show his work from 50 and 51. That's not good for an artist. Oops. Um, and uh, let me see if I can get this to go off. And the last year of his life, or 18 months, he, he doesn't do any work at all. Like, literally, he's drinking beers all day. 
And um, that probably was a, you know, a cycle where it didn't make him feel any better. And you know, critics that had been his friends, like Clement Greenberg, maybe could have been more supportive, but maybe they couldn't. I mean, how do you, how do you support something that you don't necessarily believe in, or you're not understanding the direction that an artist is going in? And to bring back sort of figuration or more drawing, um, to get away from, from something that um, the critics had appreciated for three years and said was the pinnacle of um, modern American art, right? It's shown in vogue with you know, models standing in front of it. It's, it's you know, in Life magazine. Here was this hero, and, and, and it was all bound up with the art that he made at that moment. So it was really difficult, and, and his production was not very prolific at all. I think 49 was his most prolific. Uh, I have a question about um, his desire to be a sculptor. Yes. Can you comment on that? Sure. Um, even from an early age, when he was at the, the um, high school for manual arts, um, and I do want to say that he didn't know from the beginning, I should backtrack and say he didn't know from the beginning that he wanted to be an artist. So it wasn't like Pablo Picasso saying, you know, his first word was lapis, pencil, or something like that, you know. Um, he was like 14, and you know, one day he's like, yeah, I think I want to be an artist like my brother Charles. So that's not to say he wasn't sincere. It's just to say he, he hadn't figured that all out. Um, but in high school, he said he wanted to, to carve. And when he first comes to New York, um, and you know, that's expensive. I mean, materials, that's expensive. But when he first comes to New York, he takes free classes at, um, at um, the, the Greenwich House and at the um, Henry Street Settlement. And even when he's at the Art Students League, when he drops um, John Sloan as his teacher, he takes sculpting. Um, and, you know, I mean, it, it's a difficult thing, because I think he realized that he didn't have it in him and that that wasn't going to be his strength. And again, you know, I don't want you to come out of this talk thinking that I think Pollock is a second-rate hack that he copied from everybody or that he, you know, that he couldn't paint, because I think he could paint. Now, I, you know, I don't know what he would have done with sculpture, but, um, but I think he felt a certain lack of confidence um, early on with that. But he does say, I want to be like Michelangelo. So. Yeah, just a little. Welcome. I, this may follow through what I asked about. I love, I love his work, but mm -hmm. I don't understand it. There was some controversy about a painting that was purchased many years ago in, uh, in a thrift shop by uh -huh. this woman and all this controversy about whether it was or was not. Mm -hmm. I wonder two things. Yeah. What developed from that and also um, what they saw in that painting that couldn't equate it to Jackson Pollock. Okay. Um, I, I'm going to disappoint you in the sense that I don't know about that particular situation. I wish that I did. So I don't know the outcome of what happened of a, of a Pollock um, being found in a thrift store, which is uh, you know, all of our dream, right, to find. To, <laughs> I, and I paid $15 for that, you know, take it to the antique road show and um, get your bang for your buck, right? You don't want to end up in the booth, right? You want to, yeah. Um, you know, $4 million, that, that's what you want to be. <laughs> so, um, but uh, it, there are a couple of things, and, and one of the things, um, this may seem like a tangent, but a lot of press has been given recently to um, scientists coming in and, and analyzing sort of brushwork and different components, not of like paint, you know, like is this from 1940 or is this from 1950 and it couldn't be a Pollock because it's a 1980 synthetic whatever, although he was using house paints and things. Sort of the DNA and the DNA of um, technique and process that like Van Gogh's work looks very similar, um, you know, to certain both other artists, like a couple of different other artists, but, but also to himself. And that Pollock, you know, has a certain mode of working that you would think he wouldn't be. He's exploring, oh, you know, every day's different. He didn't drink while he was painting. You may or may not know that, but like, so he's not drunk when he's doing that. But this idea that, you know, um, you can actually analyze in different ways. So I know that that's sort of come out more recently. And, um, you know, people saying, I can tell you what a Pollock looks like in terms of that. Um, you know, I mean, some of the easiest art history is to sort of go back and check records and provenance and things like that, but we can't always do that for something, you know, in a thrift shop or, you know, um, for a long time, Lee Krasner could verify or she was called upon to verify different things. But um, it's, I have been told that it's really hard to create a Pollock. Um, our conservators have tried to make them at MoMA. 
and I'm sure other people have too, like to get the feel of a Pollock. Um, and I think that um, I know there are attributors like with Miro, where they can just say it's just not right. Um, and I think that counts to a large extent as well, that gut feeling of people who know in and out every single work that this person has done, and no matter how abstract, where we're like, oh, well, it's not all of his figural, you know, it doesn't matter. It's this gut feeling that you know that that's not the right size, that's not what he would do, that he always left a little blank space, that kind of thing. So I don't know in particular, although I'm going to go, this is going to be my new homework, to, to find out what happened and, um, and to keep searching in thrift stores for Pollocks. Yeah. Uh, I, um, coming from the standpoint of um, one of the world's greatest artists, excuse my modesty, but um, uh, I, read the, I read that um, Pollock met um, Hans Hoffman, who was considered the master teacher yes. in Life magazine. And Pollock said, uh, excuse me, Hoffman said, you ought to come and study with me. And Pollock never forgave him for that insult. Yeah, yeah. And I had studied in a great high school in Detroit. You know, mm -hmm. I thought I was talented enough in that. I knew something was missing, and then I got I studied at the Chicago Art Institute with a dis leading disciple of Hans Hoffman, uh -huh. and I had to begin from zero with something that was powerful to this day, is a challenge and all I can handle. Yeah. And it's funny to me that, you know, like Pollock, I thought was terrible. I just thought he <laughs> turned out, I think he was tortured by knowing that he was working with a limited concept. Uh -huh. And I think it take a, took a lot of, for him to make the, to have that realization, and it was tragic finally. Uh, but I, I appreciate him more and more when I see what you presented here. He did have talent, and I didn't, you know, I don't think I was really sensitive to that fact. But for me personally, when I finish a work of art and the push and pull that Hans Hoffman's works, the big problem then is how the hell do you sign a painting uh -huh. when it doesn't when it doesn't breathe? And that's when I have to do what Pollock did. <laughs> so, Very interesting. I, well, I thank you on, on so many levels for that, and, and, um, and I had meant to bring in Hans Hoffman, so thank you for doing that. While I didn't show a picture of his studio, um, he lived uh, or, or worked um, on 8th Street as well, um, and you know, of course, Lee Krasner had had the opportunity to study with Hans Hoffman, as did so many people. I mean, he impacted and influenced so many people through his teaching, through his um, students who went on to teach, and um, you know, in the village, but also in um, Provincetown, where he you know was every summer. And such such an important figure. And you know, when I talk about where does the drip come from, you know, Hans Hoffman got there first in um, a work called Spring. There are drips. He he flung the paint, but because it was small scale. You know, he didn't get his due because he was the older generation, because he was German, whatever, you know, these things. But I think, you know, um, people at the time certainly recognized, and I think people should continue to recognize um, the importance of what you're saying, stripping it down, getting back to basics, because if you don't have that push and pull, and if you don't really honestly, you know, and I mean urgently, um, work through that, then, um, and I'm not an artist, so I'm, I'm going to, you know, step out of that, but I mean, um, in terms of the way I've heard artists discuss it, it incredibly important, incredibly important um, that he had so many of these fundamentals down, and that's why I think he was such a beloved teacher. But also to get back to what you said, yes, I mean, he and Pollock did not get along. He had been, you know, Lee Krasner's teacher, Lee Krasner introduced him to, well, everybody. <laughs> she introduced him to Clement Greenberg and Mondrian and, and Hans Hoffman, and um, yes, I mean, they, they didn't get along when Pollock, he didn't want to go to Provincetown one summer, because he didn't want to run in to Hans Hoffman. But yeah, that idea that, you know, you should come and study with me. Really? You know, I have nothing to learn, right? Well, you need to draw from nature. Well, I am nature, you know? And that's a statement of confidence, that I, you know, that id, but also comes out of a sort of uncomfortable place. And I think that was the push and pull of Pollock that was so difficult. I, I won't say it would have been all better if he you know, listened to Hans Hoffman. It would have perhaps been a different story. Um, but that wasn't meant to be. Yeah, but thank you so much for sharing that. And, and it's so beautiful to hear of your experience in terms of that. So, Thank yeah. you, everybody. Thanks for coming.